I'm Gilbert Cruz, editor of the New York Times Book Review, and this is the Book Review Podcast. We have another book club episode for you this week, and our editor, MJ Franklin, who you might have heard on our previous episodes about Demon Copperhead or the Heaven and Earth Grocery Store, is once again taking the reins. Now, this is an in-depth conversation about Percival Everett's book, Erasure, so if you're spoiler-averse, beware. You have been warned. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hello, and welcome to another book club episode of the Book Review Podcast. I'm MJ Franklin. I'm an editor here at the New York Times Book Review, and this week we're chatting about Percival Everett's 2001 novel, Erasure. There are a lot of reasons we chose to talk about this book as our book club pick, but the two main ones are, first, it's just a great book. Spoiler alert of how I feel about it. It's a book that goes deep and gives readers so much to discuss. And second, a little thing called the Oscars. You may have heard of it. Erasure was adapted into a movie called American Fiction, which has been nominated for five Oscars at this year's Academy Awards, including Best Picture. The novel was critically acclaimed when it first came out in 2001, and now the movie has catapulted Erasure back to the top of the zeitgeist and introduced it to even more readers. And a book that's on everyone's minds and provides a lot to chew on, that sounds like a book club pick for us. This combo also seems fitting because we're on the eve of yet another Percival Everett release. His new novel, James, which is a retelling of Huckleberry Finn told from Jim's perspective, comes out later in March. But first, let's talk about Erasure. Joining me in discussing this novel are two incredible guests, colleagues, readers. First, a voice you know, you love. She's on this podcast often, Shumana Khatib. Welcome, Shumana. Hey, MJ. Thanks for having me. Of course. Or I guess I should say welcome back because <laughs> you were on our Heaven and Earth Grocery Store podcast episode at the end of 2023. The only book club I've ever managed to be invited back to. Oh my gosh. I hope you keep coming back. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Also with us is Reggie Ugwu, a reporter over on the Times' Culture Desk. Hi, Reggie. Thank you for joining us. Hello. What a treat. Thanks for having me. Reggie, can you tell us, what do you cover for the Times? I cover a lot of different things, but generally pop culture-ish. I'm a bit of a roving culture reporter writing about film, TV, music, podcasts, and a bunch of other things here and there. That wide-ranging focus, I think, is going to be perfect for this novel, which also, I think, has a wide-ranging focus. I also want to mention, you interviewed Court Jefferson, who adapted and directed American fiction for The Times. Indeed. So, listeners, this is all to say, we really do have an all-star team assembled to dive into <laughs> this book. But before we dive in, I think we should set up the novel. So I have a little plot synopsis. <laughs> Good luck, MJ. I know, this I'm nervous. Big, yeah, it's a hairy dog. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best to do it in like two minutes. The time starts now. now. All right. Erasure is a satirical novel by Percival Everett. It follows a Black writer and academic, Thelonious Monk Ellison. Another spoiler alert, I will be using Thelonious and Monk interchangeably. I don't know why, how my brain works, but that's what's going to happen. Monk has a modest career. He's written several books, but they're not commercially successful, and he's annoyed about that. He's annoyed that his books, which are novels that reimagine Greek classics or French philosophy, are mischaracterized and misclassified. He's annoyed that he's told his books would sell better if he wrote about Black life. When Erasure opens, Thelonious is having trouble selling his next book, and then he sees the success of Juanita Mae Jenkins, a Black commercial fiction writer. She's written a book called Wees Lives in the Ghetto, which is being heralded by the publishing industry as the next great Black novel and an authentic portrayal of Blackness in America, despite its poor quality and clearly inauthentic origins. The author herself says she was inspired by just a few days visiting her family in Harlem. Frustrated, Thelonious decides, I can play that game too, and he writes a novel called My Pathology, which is a horribly offensive story about a young Black man running afoul of the law. Once he's finished drafting the novel, he tells his agent to submit it to a publisher under the alias Stagar Lee, and plot twist, the publishing industry eats it up. Meanwhile, Monk is grappling with a lot of challenges in his life. His sister, who works at a women's health clinic, is killed. His mother has Alzheimer's and is dying, and his brother, who is married to a woman but is gay and closeted, starts to struggle in his own life. All of these threads all intersect through Monk, leading to an existential crisis of sorts. 
Jumana, Reggie, did I miss anything huge in that? Anything a remarkably that you wanted... succinct job. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. Yeah. <laughs> to start this conversation, I just want to do a general temperature check. I'm going to go around, get your general thoughts on the book. This is what you would say if someone came up to you at a party and was like, hey, I heard you read Erasure. And you would say, I thought blank. I'm going to start with you, Jumana. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, first, I would say to the person, how much time do you have? <laughs> loved this book. I saw American Fiction before I read the book. I'd read Percival Everett before. I love watching his mind on the page. He's funny. He's irreverent. He's sarcastic. There's nobody that writes like him. And I have to tell you that Erasure totally blew me away just because of the sheer number of textures in this book. Like, of course, there is the book that Monk writes as Staggerly that's completely contained within the novel. It is shocking it is shocking the amount of times i was like nervously laughing while reading i was like this is part of but i don't know what i'm reading right now (laughs) it is a remarkable cultural product i love how funny it is i love that it never like it always borders that line between it's obviously a parodical novel it's obviously unbelievably satirical and it's just outrageous enough that it keeps the momentum without it feeling schlocky or sticky or actually, I don't know what the proper term for that would be. But yeah, I'm I'm very enthusiastic about it. I love that. And I also feel like, yeah, this book is so lively and like, yeah, schlocky, sticky, but also so sharp at the same time. Yeah. Um, what about you, Reggie? What did you think? I loved it. Yeah, I agree with everything that Jumana was saying. I thought it was it was so delicious to see his mind at work and to see him pivoting between all the different writing styles, especially the the novel within the novel. And so I felt like the reading experience was yeah, unlike any that that I can remember having and I just thought that it was also like commercial in in, in a weird way mm-hmm. like for for given the the text of the of, of the book because what Monk is going through is so classic. It's so universal, like dealing with family trouble, an ailing parent, grieving for his sister, love trouble, career trouble, ident- grappling with his identity. And you can point to any number of classic works from American <laughs> fiction. Title <laughs> alert. Movie <laughs> title alert. <laughs> that that are, are similar. So it, it's one of those things, too, where it, made, it makes me feel like, yeah, I wish this book had been... Bigger, although now it's getting a lot more attention, obviously. But I can certainly see what Core Jefferson saw in it and why it made a movie that has become as successful as American fiction has. I went back to read some like contemporaneous reviews of the book from when it came out, and there, I think there must have been some kind of publicity material attached to it when it came out that said it was like a a, fa- a family story, a love story, a coming of age. And I was like, yeah, that and so like with the biggest asterisk next to it. <laughs> it's like <laughs> That's part of the fun of the novel is like you come in for the literary critique and you come away with this like family story. You come in for the family story. You get the story about authenticity. Like it's it's constantly pivoting and changing. I know we've talked about this novel in snippets, but MJ, what were your impressions? And did you go into this with expectations or did you manage to like clear those from your mind? I went in with little to no expectations. I had heard of Erasure Rumbling, but I came to it because of the movie. I saw that this book was being adapted to a movie and I always like to read the book first before seeing the movie. And so I was like, I'm going to add it to my reading list. But before I read it, I read The Trees by Percival Everett, which came out, what, two years ago? And it's this kind of like buddy cop meets like horribly gory, like racial commentary in the South. So that was in the back of my mind. And then I went into this knowing very little, and I also loved it. (laughs) I thought the word that comes to mind for me is unconstrained. Like, this is a novel about a writer who feels like stuck in a certain mode, stuck in a certain position in the literary world. And the novel itself is the complete opposite. As we mentioned before, like, it just pivots. It's exploring literary culture. It's exploring family. It's exploring authenticity. It's exploring, like, this idea of, like being true to ourselves and it's doing that also with form it it, there are footnotes in here the entire middle section of the book is just the fake book in the book and so there's something about it that's like so destabilizing in form and yet it's lively it's sharp 
it's funny, but his like pen is out. His <laughs> knives are out and he has something to say. Like, I, I feel like he's doing all of this all in like 265 pages. Right. Yeah. It's remarkable. I think this book is a triumph. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just like how quickly he's moving, like what he's able to like marshal, because I agree with you that there is some element where this is a very off leash novel. Right. And it's really wild. But at the same time, there's so much mastery behind it. Right. Because you can imagine in somebody else's hands, like imagine dialogue between philosophers could go so Mm -hmm. wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. Or even Mm -hmm. like even in that one scene where there are two artists who are arguing about the collaboration about a drawing that's been erased and then who owns it. Like, that could have been tedious. Like, I went to liberal arts school. Like, (laughs) I know that that could have gotten really tedious really fast. And I think it's just all part of, all part of the project and what's made it so much fun. He has a great sense of of pace. Like, he doesn't, never waste time. Like, those snippets you're talking about, they last for a few lines and then he moves on. And most of the novel is broken up into these short little scenes, these little vignettes. And you can tell that, yeah, it's the work of a very sophisticated and mature writer who knows exactly what to leave on the page and exactly what he can cut. And there are some moments where I marveled when he would just leap the plot forward in a few lines and talking about, Mom died. She was buried. We brother, my brother left, and and you and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa! So much is happening, but you don't really need to know any more than that before he sets up the next scene. I completely agree. And what I think helps carry us, the reader, along is there's so much theoretically. It's so much plot that happens, but you really are stuck in his head as Thelonious is thinking about all of this. And that through line is so sharp and pointed, even as the plot, even as the form of the novel kind of jumps and jumps around. Another word that comes to mind is virtuosic. And I think, too, like part of what makes this book so brilliant is that like the erasure of the title is happening on so many levels, right? Like even what's left off the page in service of keeping the story moving is a form of erasure, right? Or editing or or cutting or whatever, but it's still part and parcel of what I think one of the book's claims is. Yeah. Wait, can you say more about this? <laughs> yeah, say more I'm about also this? curious <laughs> yeah. about, about the title, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, so one thing, and I I think we'll get to the movie in a little bit, but but one thing that felt very different in terms of the experience of reading the book versus seeing the movie was just how much loss was accruing as the book was going on, right? Like, I could see myself progressing through the book, and it was like, oh, man, like, Lisa's dead. Oh, man, like, Bill's marriage is over. Like, oh, man, like, like his mother's fading, right? Like even like the sense of stability, like Lorraine, even Lorraine going to get married is a sense of loss. And to say nothing of like the internal struggle and like this kind of battle between Monk and his alter ego, Staggerly, right? Like, and I, so that just like really surmounted and I think gave it a lot of momentum too, but it's, it's this tension of like, you're accruing things that are lost. Like, it, Yeah. I, I'm i just like at school right now. I love this because <laughs> I was looking at like the idea of erasure through art and through representation in art, but I never connected the dots of like, oh, he's also accruing loss as well. And like that is just another another layer to his critique. When I was taking my notes here, I wrote that with erasure, Percival Everett is a writer at play and a thinker and craftsman at work. Like mm-hmm. everything he like he's writing with a poet's level of precision and layering here. And that's just yet another one. And then, of course, there's this uh, alter ego that he's created, which is ostensibly represents everything that he detests. And by the end of the novel, he effectively has is, is, is doubled the character and become the character in a way, which is a kind of erasure of his of his self or an ego death, as you were alluding to earlier, Jumana. Can you tell us more about that alter ego? We have alluded to him. Let's dive in. The alter ego of the writer of this novel called My Pathology later simply f- yeah. Which can we can we say that? Uh, no. Okay. okay. Well, later it's it's named what we call an expletive in the New York Times in the pages of the of, of this paper. Um, then there's the character Van Gogh, spelled V A N space G O. So what do we know about Stagar Lee? He's allegedly a convicted felon who has just come out of jail. And this is his first book, which he says he wrote in a week. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And may we all be so lucky to have a first book that is like acclaimed as Stag Arlie's. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. So he's like super evasive, obviously, because he's not a real person. And so he's really playing with subverting expectations, right? Where he goes to meet like somebody who just bought the film rights for some exorbitant amount of money. Three million dollars. Three million dollars. And you can tell that they're at some place and and uh, when he orders a, a Gibson and then the chilled carrot ginger soup to start, everybody's <laughs> sort of like, what is going on? Like, like, is this guy real? And it's like, <laughs> yeah. What I loved about him, and he's such a great alter ego, is because, like, Thelonious does not set the rules. He is being pushed aside in the literary world. He does not have the claim that he wants, but feels like he deserves. Stagar Lee. We are playing his game. We are living life on his terms when he's like, I will do this interview, but no one will see me. And people are like, that's not going to work. And he's like, but it will. Or when he's setting the price and he's like, this is the price that I want. Like he, he, or changing the title. Or changing the title. Exactly. And his publisher is like, or his agent and publisher are like, this is not really going to work. And he's like, but it will, or I'll walk away. Like he, he's such an interesting foil for Thelonious. So I went on kind of a, a deep dive where I was like, where is Staggerly coming? Like, what is that name? Right. And it's, I guess, like, if you read JSTOR on the weekends, like oh an unnamed <laughs> book review editor might. A lot of academics and critics have made the point that, like, it's it's referring to, like, an American folk song that's based on... It's based on a real life figure named Stagger Lee. Oh my God. Who's like a shady businessman, I think, in Mississippi, <laughs> who killed somebody. And this became the grist of like, like lore and a folk song. So when you think about the like the kind of references and like actual like American literature tradition that he's drawing from, it makes it a little it's a nice little Easter egg. Yeah, it's a character from folk songs and from toasts. Yeah, which is like in kind of African American poetry folk poetry and it's a recurring character who is like he's like a gangster he walks into a bar and he shoots a guy because he doesn't like his hat or something like that <laughs> and he's just known as a badass i love this this is a prime example of why book clubs are helpful because it like just like opens up the book i feel like this is very layered and we can keep going and we're going to dive in some more but first i think we should take a quick break And we're back. This is the Book Review Podcast. I'm MJ Franklin. I'm joined by Jumana Khatib and Reggie Ungwu, and we're discussing Erasure by Percival Everett. We just chatted about our general thoughts. We set the stage with all the characters. We talked about how much layering is happening in this book. And now I kind of want to turn it over to you, Reggie and Jumana, about what you're curious to discuss. Again, this is a book that like continually opens up. There's so much packed into it. And I'm curious, like, what threads of this book spoke to you? What ideas stood out? Are there are questions that you had that you're kind of wondering and just want to speak to another reader about. Yeah, I'm really curious about people's reactions to the novel within the novel and the feeling that you had when it finished and you find yourself dropped back into the world of Thelonious and leaving the, wor the world of Van Gogh. This is not going to get any less confusing as we go, I'm afraid. <laughs> because, yeah, the, it's, as you say, it's, it's, it, it's shocking, but I found it like, good i don't know like it's like like not good obviously in the terms of the prose is good but it's just very plotty like it's written clearly by somebody who knows what they're doing you introduce this character who you can't help but sympathize with because of the cartoonish extremity of his circumstances and you just want to know what's going to happen to this guy like he's just like a lit fuse walking around in the world and so i find my i found myself kind of like dropping into a different mode as a reader almost when I was in that section and I was like turning the pages faster and like relaxing a little bit like you like you do when you're like reading uh, trash literature or watching trash television but you can't turn <laughs> away from it and then yeah to like for the story to end and it's done so economically like the rest of the book like we were discussing where you get this whole novel I think it's about 70 pages and at the end you're kind of like well, wait, what happens next? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which, of course, is the mark of, of, of a good, compelling read. So I'm curious what you got, what your guys' reactions were. And, and I also, like, I felt conflicted about that, right? Obviously, because you're like, oh, I'm, how much should I be enjoying this? And what would Percival ever think of me that I like this thing that he made that is supposed to be so contemptible? 
Yeah, I mean, I had I had a very similar experience, Reggie, where it was almost like eating without chewing, where I was like, I gotta see what happens next. <laughs> like, I gotta see, I gotta see what's happening with Cleona, or like, you know, or like, I gotta see what's gonna happen at the TV studio. Or it was, it wasn't quite a hate read, but it really, it's a mirror, right? Like when you look at your own reactions to it. And one thing that I think is true across all, all of his books that I've read, I'm willing to wager that it's true in all of Percival Everett's writing, is that he's so attuned to, like, language and power. So reading my pathology, which is, is such a, a perfect example of how Monk and Percival is able to weaponize language and expectation and, and like, stereotype to hold a mirror up to the reader, to the public— and to himself. My reaction was, I also loved it. I love <laughs> yeah. that middle section. And I felt so guilty about it. But like, I truly, my jaw was dropped the entire <laughs> time while reading it. Starting with first, when you see, number one, how my pathology is spelled. And then you see like, how he spells the numbers as if like, Van Gogh Jenkins can't spell number two. Or like, <laughs> like he's like, it's like a, exactly. Like, like it, you could tell, this is where I was like, this is a writer at play. You can tell Percival Everett sat down and was like, I'm going to write the worst novel I can actually think of and also make it incredible. <laughs> and the thing that I loved about it too is that in addition to like that kind of like, oh my gosh, this is so bad, I can't put it down. Reggie, you were right. Like the way he so quickly establishes the stakes, he like, you're somehow like really invested in following what this person's going to do, even though, like, you know he shouldn't be doing any of the things <laughs> that he's doing. I counted, I think he assaults someone in every single <laughs> chapter in this book. <laughs> That's out of control. And yet, like... All the way up to out and out murder at the end. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And yet, so like your jaw is dropped because you're like, I can't believe he's going there. And that's why I think this book is so good because Percival Everett is going there. It gives this novel this like electric thrill that is so necessary because otherwise this is a really cerebral novel about like authenticity and believing yourself and following your art, right? It needs something to kind of like carry you along. And yet that whole... Like, I feel bad about this, and yet I can't put it down, is the subject of the critique. It's like, the critique is like how we receive these books, and how we consume these books, and how we talk about them. And so for him to be doing this, like, intertextual play in the novel that is then being, like, staged in us, the reader, is brilliant. Right, yeah. And it's maybe worth pointing out that what was fun about it to me, and I think that we've all kind of identified, is the way it uses these kind of hacky tropes and uses them well not because it is an authentic portrayal of the black experience <laughs> which is the reaction that the literary world and the uh, publishers in the novel have to it and that is so offensive to monk and i find it offensive as well the thing to remember too is like this is the only writing by monk that we get in the book right Ooh, like yeah we don't see any passages from his kind of like high-flying, like, Greek myth riffs. Like, I think we see a bit from his introduction or from a talk he gave about Roland yeah, Barthes, but yes. I don't think that we get any of his creative writing. That's an excellent point. The other thing I want to say is, like, Reggie, going off of your point, Percival Everett gives us permission. We are knowing. He's playing with all of these really offensive stereotypes, but we know that Monk is setting out to write a bad novel and that gives us the reader permission to enjoy and laugh at it because we know we're not supposed to be taking this earnestly as the publishing industry is taking it earnestly. He's pulled us in and yet set us at a remove. It's really complicated staging, I think. But I think that that's, it works because it probably, it like, it gets at probably how he feels, which is like close to it and yet so far. So he's very fluent and conversant in the sort of language and dialect and register of like the intelligentsia that we tend to think of as running publishing. And yet he's also held at a remove, just like how we are from the story, you know? What about you, Jumana? Is there anything that you were still thinking about in relation to this book? Yeah, a lot. One thing about reading the book that really enriched my understanding of Monk and the story is that I think the movie has a tighter focus, which I think it would have to. I don't know that a movie could like satisfactorily convey all the texture and life going on in this book. 
But I came away from the book feeling like this was just as much a story of like the development and the destruction of a creative self as it was a send up of the publishing industry and the racial dynamics and bias. Right. And, and I say this as somebody like who is trying to really get away from the tendency to read books as a product of their time. And, and I do think that this book holds up over 20 years later. But in a way, like if I were lucky enough to still corner that person at a party and talk about this book, I think that what I would say that the most emotionally resonant or salient piece of it is how Monk conceives of himself as an artist and destroys it by the end. Yep. Absolutely. Like I, I underlined a passage in the book where he's talking about like selling this book and what he's doing with this book. And he says, I considered everything that was not good about the novel I was about to publish that I submitted for the very reason it was not good. But now the fact was killing me. It was a parody, certainly, but so easy had it been to construct that I found it difficult to take it seriously, even as that is going down this passage thinking about like what he is doing with this novel. And then he ends the paragraph by saying, Then I caught the way I was thinking and realized the saddest thing of all, that I was thinking myself into a funk about idiotic and pretentious bullshit to avoid the real accusation staring me in the face. I was a sellout. Like, that for me is like authenticity and selling out is such a key part of this novel. And as you said, Jumani, you're watching this, this writer totally destroy himself and his craft. As everything else about life as he knows it is annihilated. For me, it wasn't just about selling out, but also about like, this is why I keep saying the word authenticity, because that's also what his family is grappling with. I have another quote. <laughs> MJ with the quotes. He says about his family, Bill kept his secret that was no secret. Mother kept no secrets at all. Lisa kept secrets that remained with her and father kept secrets and talked about them all the time. I am convinced of this. Like all of the people, not even just in the literary world, but in his life have secrets and things that they're trying to hide and things that they're trying to focus on. And like the idea of being authentic to that is so critical. That's what happens with Bill, who's just kind of like come out the closet and his life crumbles because he's trying to be authentic to himself. And meanwhile, that's what like Thelonious is grappling with as he's authentic to the types of books he wants to write. He's grappling with the fact that that's not going to be commercially viable. And then he sells out and that is, and that gives him power. I'm grappling with the question, like, do you think that he, like, is, does the book end with him as a sellout? Maybe the answer is just yes, but I wonder how you feel about that. Well, I don't read Latin fluently, <laughs> so so I'm relying on translations of the last line. I don't think of him as a sellout. I think of him as somebody who's riffing on himself. I mean, maybe I'm thinking that because I'm like, he's named after Ralph Ellison and Thelonious mm -hmm. Monk, right? So there is some, like artistic legacy that's getting drawn from here. I think of him like he's riffing on himself. Oh, interesting. I totally thought of him as a sellout because he's admitting that. And then he's talking himself into circles to justify it, bang, being like, I'm not selling out. This is actually this commentary. And yet mm -hmm. part of the tension is that like he needs the money that this novel is giving him to take care of his family. And so for me, I did think of him as a sellout. And part of what I loved about this novel is I feel like there are no right or wrong answers, even though Percival Everett is very clear about what he's satirizing. Like, it makes sense why Thelonious is selling out in the way that he's selling out, and it gives him emotional stakes of, like, you need this money. It also, like, pokes fun of Thelonious. He's been asked a lot oh. to a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. So, like, even as he's right, he's not good. And I thought, I thought of him as a complicated sellout, but I did think of him as a sellout. What about you, Reggie? In some ways, he, he's he's obviously a sellout, right? Like he did this thing that he hates and 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 resents in the world. He made his own version of it, and then he took the money, right? And the book makes a point of continuously pointing out, yes, he took the money and he kept the money, and he does good things with the money, like he supports his family, as you say. But yeah, so in that sense, he took the money and ran, and that makes him a sellout. But yeah, I'm also. I feel like there's more to say and get because because he's riffing because it is this alter ego I guess because his name at least by the end of the novel his name Thelonious Ellison is still not associated with it right so he can continue on that career path wherever it leads he's able to have it both ways but 
yeah, it's like he is a sellout, but so what? Like there, like he's got a point in his career where like there are other things that are concerning to him. Yeah, I think that's actually a good point. I want to pivot to the movie off of that because I think the movie kind of tackles that consideration like head on. But this is where I say I actually have not seen the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so I am curious your thoughts purely as like a should I see the movie I am if this were a novel I'd be that clueless character that enters so you can direct exposition to. <laughs> oh boy. Um, I'm curious your thoughts about the movie and how this book translates into a movie I'm going to start with you Jumana tell me about the movie I had a blast I mean there were moments when I had my hands clamped over my eyes in something that must approximate the sort of self-loathing that Monk felt, right? I guess we would say it reached me emotionally. <laughs> but I think, I mean, I honestly don't know that a movie could have done more intellectual and like vibe justice to this book. And I, I, and I do really believe that there was no way to make a movie that could have touched on every single thing in this book. And so I think the focus worked really well. I loved having a character of Monk, like, I think watching Monk move through the world, it gave me a really good framework. And I liked having him as like an avatar when I was reading. I know some authors don't love hearing that. But I think that like the insouciance and the, and again, the sort of like middle finger that is inherent to all of this book, it's just a question of like to whom it's directed is like totally present on the screen. I loved it. I thought it was great. How about you, Reggie? I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I thought it was a really smart adaptation. And yeah, faithful to the spirit of the novel and its ideas, even though it makes some significant changes and and leaves out a lot. Um, And it's such brilliant casting. Jeffrey Wright, I mean, you could not imagine a more perfect Thelonious Monk. And the casting throughout, yeah, the way Sterling K. Brown brings Bill to life, the way Leslie Uggams brings his mom to life, and Tracy Ellis Ross as Lisa, the sister. There are some significant changes. I don't know if we're spoiling, and you haven't seen it. I don't know if I want to spoil it. This is a spoiler (laughs) episode, and I'm one of those people that I don't care about spoilers. I'll see it eventually. (laughs) So let's spoil it. Let's dive in. Yeah, well, I'm curious about two big changes. One is the death of the sister in the book obviously is an assassination um in the movie it's a heart attack i'm just curious about that and she she works as a doctor at a at a a woman's reproductive clinic and 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 in the book she's killed by a an anti-abortion protester yeah Yeah. but they they changed the way she dies in the movie yeah it's just a heart attack Hmm. very anodin heart attack yeah and then the other big thing is Centara Golden is the name of the novel, the novelist of We Wee's Lives in the Ghetto in the movie versus um, Juanita Mae Jenkins in the book. And that character is further developed and plays a bigger role in the movie, played by Issa Rae, and actually has an encounter with Monk that is a pivotal scene toward the end of the film. And that was also a really interesting departure from the, from the book. And see, I I think that having having an external foil in the movie really helped keep it from getting too abstract. Right. Cause you do, there is a real, there is that scene where you see Monk writing a staggerly. He's in his dad's study. The man is hate writing, right? Like I've never, like I look like that when I'm writing letters to exes or people (laughs) who've wronged me, but like you can see and you can see and, and they do a good job of kind of giving voice to the, novel it obviously doesn't take up as much of the movie as the book but i think having like an external foil who's outside of monk's own mind and self helped bring some of those conflicts to life a little more i ask a question of both of you which is first it's a two-part question how did you come to this story did you come movie first and then read the book or did you come book first and then read the movie movie first it's movie first movie first yeah how did reading the book change your understanding of the movie and vice versa? Did the movie kind of key you in on certain elements or change how you experience the book? Well, I was thinking about the balance of, of the satire of the publishing industry versus the family drama. I think the movie, interestingly, like, I don't know if it the way it was marketed in the trailer leaned more heavily on the satire, which I think is probably a smart 
marketing decision. But I was interested to read in the the book that like at least three quarters of the book is Monk and his family. Like the publishing world is not a huge presence. So that was really interesting and and it helped me understand the choices in the, in the film actually, because yeah, the film also is mostly about the Ellison family. Yeah. So that's, that's how the book changed my understanding of the film. I think it helped to see Monk in a more diverse ecosystem. The movie is so tightly focused on him as a writer, him as a sort of dutiful son. I liked having more access to his interiority and I liked understanding. I actually liked seeing the world, like this is a strong and complicated word for what I'm about to say, but like seeing the world through his eyes in the context of the book. Whereas from the movie, you're kind of watching this unfold from a bit of a remove. And so it's a different experience. Like I was more emotionally engaged with the book for sure for sure whereas I think I was able to see the movie like I was able to see what the movie was after and it felt more like a romp that we were all in on the joke got it that's the sense I got from the trailer too and I was like that energy that I feel like I experienced while reading my pathology seemed to be like the focus (laughs) of the energy in the trailer which made me really excited to see it I felt like I having the access to his interiority and particularly his writing and made help me know the character on a much deeper level and I've made it endeared me to the character and to his plight because you see his brilliance and you can really feel for the way he's struggling to get through to people get through to his his colleagues and to make a mark in his in his industry and you understand why he would be so offended by something like we lives in the ghetto. And I think because you are so intimately familiar with his talent and his plight and his mind, you don't need to like him as much. Mm-hmm. Whereas without the benefit of that access to to that level of depth of in, in the film, the film has to work a little bit harder, I think, to make him quote unquote a likable figure. And I think that's one thing that I preferred about the book is it doesn't work as hard to make him likable and yet you still relate to him and empathize with him. We've talked about the book. We've talked about the movie. And now we want to broaden the conversation and just talk about other satires kind of inspired by how erasure American fiction is a satire of the book publishing industry. And so I want to ask you, Reggie Jumana, What are your favorite literary satires? These are satires published in book form, not necessarily specifically satires of the literary industry, though if that's the subject of your book, great. But what are some of your favorite literary satires? I will say Lightning Rods by Helen DeWitt. I don't know that I would ever read another book about a vacuum cleaner salesman. Wait, what? (laughs) Tell me more about this. (laughs) I almost don't want to ruin it because it is a great send-up of... This is a book where I think... Your reading experience, whoever you are, will benefit from knowing very little. But I love Helen DeWitt. She's brilliant. She wrote The Last Samurai. This feels very different. Um, And it's hysterical. And I don't tend to laugh at books, but this it's 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 a great one. So lightning rods, Helen DeWitt. Go check it out. What about you, Reggie? The one that came to mind for me is Super Sad True Love Story by Gary Steingart, Mm. which is not quite in the same high product mode of erasure, but is certainly a satire about the decline of the American Republic, (laughs) late late stage capitalism, (laughs) of American media and politics. And it takes place in kind of a near-ish future where... Yeah, there's like one corporations and government have fused and you meet this sad sack schlub who falls in love and decides he's going to live forever using a technology that may or may not be real. And I was just found it really exhilarating and hilarious. And it's my favorite of his books still. And I think about it often, but it does that thing that great satire does where it just makes you look at the world in a slightly different way it's not as experimental certainly as erasure but it does have some playful formal things going on and it's told half in the diaries of the main character and half in like the 
I don't know, they're not tweets, they're not emails. There's like a social media platform called Global Teens and you see her communications on Global Teens and that's the way that you are introduced to his paramour. So I really love that book a lot and I highly recommend it. I need to check this out. I've only read Lake Success, which I really enjoyed, but I've not read this one. I was writing it down as you were speaking. Yeah, super sad, true love story. How about you, MJ? My satire is The Guest by Emma Klein. It came out last year. Do you want to just give me a face? Let me explain. <laughs> Let me explain. Number one, that book is also wild. Imagine like my pathology, but starring a white woman in the Hamptons, but like also someone who's unconstrained and is going to do exactly the worst thing involving crimes. And you just kind of. It's called Real Housewives Ultimate Girls Trip. <laughs> oh <my> like, <laughs> truly. <laughs> anyway. But what makes me enjoy it so much as a satire is there's this incredible New York Magazine piece where they went to the Hamptons and asked people in the Hamptons, like, what do you think about this book? And the book is a parody of, like, wealth and, like, that culture. And everyone in the Hamptons were like, oh, yeah, it's satirizing the people who are, like, hangers-on, the riding the coat. Like, they, they totally did not get what was going on. And then I was like, oh, this is hilarious. It's also just, like, really... The book itself is just really electric and fun. So at first I was like, I don't know if I'd call it a satire, but after reading that story, I was like, you know what? I think I will. I think I will. So that's mine. I also wanted to mention one person who I think is doing something similar to <laughs> what Monk is doing in the book. And that is Otessa Moshfag, who wrote My Year of Rest and Relaxation. When Eileen came out, she gave this wild profile in The Guardian where she explained, Otessa is candid about Eileen being a deliberate exercise in playing with the format of commercial fiction to get attention of big publishers. Um, Mick Glue and her earlier short stories might have won awards, but they didn't pay much, and she wanted to, quote, write a novel to start a career where I could live off publishing books. That was my prime motivation for writing Eileen. I thought, fine, I'll play this game, and I still feel like I'm playing it. She said she didn't want to wait 30 years to be discovered. And she said, because there are all these morons making millions of dollars, so why not me? I'm smart and talented and motivated and disciplined and talented. Did I say that already? She's playing the game that Monk is playing and it's working. And literally saying, why not me? Which is a refrain of the main character in my <laughs> pathology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so before I go, are there any other satires that you wanted to mention? Well, we have to talk about The Sellout by Paul Beatty. Another satire that like the less I tell you about it, the better. I have a copy of that, but I have not yet read it, and I'm bumping that up on my list, too. This is not a book, which may be sacrilegious for the Book Review podcast, but if you enjoyed this book and you have not watched The Boondocks, the animated series based on the cartoon by Aaron Magruder, the animated series ran in the mid-2000s, I want to say. It has very similar themes and tone to a lot of this. I would wager that Magruder is a fan of, of Everett's. And there are a lot of like fake talk shows in this book. And that's also something that happens frequently in the boondocks. So yeah, if you enjoy this, I would check out that series. Perfect. Go check that out. And then the two other titles I wanted to mention very quickly. I'm just going to say their titles are The Other Black Girl and Yellow Face. Both are specifically literary satires. <laughs> um, but they're also, I think, if you enjoyed this, you should check that out. And I think that's all the time we have for today. <laughs> Jumana, Reggie, I just want to say a huge thank you. This is really fun. Thank you for joining us. Super fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks, MJ. And listeners, we hope you'll continue the conversation with us. I know you're listening to this in your various podcast apps, but there's also an article page for this book club discussion on the New York Times' website. We'd love for you to tell us your thoughts about the book, about this conversation, about Thelonious and Percival Everett and all of the above in the comment section there. And we'll pop in and respond to some. Again, Reggie, Jumana, readers, thank you for joining us. And until next time, happy reading. That was MJ Franklin, Jumana Khatib, and Reggie Ugwu in our book club conversation about Percival Everett's Erasure, and the Oscar-nominated film into which it was adapted, American Fiction. I'm Gilbert Cruz, editor of the New York Times Book Review. As always, thanks for listening.